So this is our sixth edition of the Global Food Policy Report. As you know, every year we select a topic to really zoom in some of the emerging issues around our global food nutrition and security. So we have focused on smallholders, we have focused on SDGs, and how we're going to reshape our food system to deliver multiple goals of, of SDGs, including climate change and so on. And this year, for 2017, we very much focus on, let's say, on, on urbanization. So the previous section, particularly um, Calder, Brave, and uh, Morgan, have already discussed a lot of issues that I'm going to discuss in the Global Food Policy Report. So I'm not going to repeat what they have said, just highlight some of the issues that, uh, that probably needs more attention and needs more policy actions. And more research. So let's not also not forget what has happened in our global food system in 2016 and also look at some of the issues in 2017 before we dive in on urbanization. So historically, in 2016, we walked through a very key milestone that is in our human history, the first time. The extreme poverty rate has come down to less than 10 percent. But this rare history, it was 40 percent, 30 percent, just a decade ago. So we must acknowledge that we made tremendous progress in reducing extreme poverty. We must also recognize that we have achieved a lot in terms of reducing hunger. If you believe FAO data, FAO data shows that again the percentage of 100 people has come down almost to 10 percent, not 10 percent yet, but I guarantee you in 2017 and 18, probably we will also walk through that milestone, that's 10 percent. And food price actually remain very low. You might still remember, I think probably you yeah, experienced enough to remember that in 20, uh, the 2007, 2008, we experienced food price crisis. <coughs> food prices went up by 100 percent just in a matter of six months, one year. But right after that, since 2009, we have never seen a such a, there's a height in food prices. Food prices remain very low. I, I expected that that would remain low for some time. What does that mean? That means poor hungry people will spend less money on food. They spend 50% of the income on food. If the prices are very low, they benefit from that. On the other hand, millions of millions of smallholders may not be able to use higher prices as an alternative. So it's a double sword edge, a double edged sword. Now, obviously, 2017 and 2016 was a transition year from MDGs to SDGs. The good news is in many countries, it's not just in New York, in Rome, in Washington, that are debating about SDGs. When you travel to different countries, the country really embraced the concept of SDGs. What does that mean? SDGs also means food and nutrition security for everybody. So not only in poor countries, but also in rich countries, not only in rural areas, but also in urban centers. The urban agenda comes to very high narrow income. The Habitat Summit, the Milan uh, Urban Food Security Agenda, and so on, and beyond. And again, what does that mean to human nutrition security? It really urges us to produce more evidence, more data, more policy recommendations, actionable policy recommendations. Uh, and Rudolfi was here last year, well, he, he comes to our event every year. Every year he said, oh, that we needed to finish the last mile. This year I heard that we, missed, we must finish the last inch. So we're getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's continue to, to work on that. Next year, maybe when we love it comes, maybe half inch or maybe yeah. we're totally close to, to enough to, to the people we're really concerned. Now, looking forward to 2017, now if you look at newspaper, media, you will see the keywords for famine. Famine is coming. After so many years, the famine in Bangladesh and Ethiopia, we almost forgot about it. But just about six months ago, everybody was alert. Oh, famine is coming. Somalia, northern Nigeria, Yemen, um, and uh, um, another country, uh, let's say Yemen, Somalia, 
Um, so, uh, Nigeria, Northern Nigeria. So all of these four countries. I mean, some countries are surprising. Others are actually not. Why did this come back again? Why is that? I mean, that yeah, puts very important questions to international agencies, foreign agencies, researchers like us, as well as practitioners. Many of you are in the room. So how are we going to do with that? Another big issue is political change. We have already heard from Carol and many others. The yeah. political landscape has changed in the US, in the UK, and in many other countries. Even with the it, some of the country, you think the color has not changed in France, but the, the political narratives have changed. Globalization <coughs> has benefited the you know, average person in that country. But it's still the case that many poor hungry people have not benefited. We thought, you know, we learned the trade theory 30 years ago, we thought trade is good for the whole society, and we thought poor and hungry people should benefit from the trade through social protection, through training, and through getting a new job somewhere else. But it has not happened. So many countries, poor and hungry people, remain to be poor and hungry, while the whole society whole world is becoming richer, wealthier. So this is a very important lesson we have learned. Urbanization in the spotlight, I think, Brave gave a very good numbers over there. I just want to let you know that right now, the percentage of urbanization is about 50%, maybe a little bit over 50%. By 2030, by 2050, it will be two-thirds. Two-thirds, two-thirds in urban area. You know, in 1990, there was two thirds in rural areas. So we basically switched it aside just in, in, in several decades. And I, here I just wanted to let you know that this urbanization rate also needs to be redefined. What do you mean urbanization? How do you, de how do you define the urban population? I think I was brave and uh, I was mentioned. You know, who are the real urban people? So the 2017 Global Food Report highlights several key challenges we are facing and some of the key opportunities. Uh, one is urban hunger. How many hungry people do we have in, in urban areas? And why they are hungry? And an urban nutrition transition, in a decade or two, we have undergone a tremendous transition, rapid transition from undernourishment to overweight and obesity. And urbanization is part of that story. Value chain. Value chain is happening. We call it a quiet revolution. Quiet. So it's happening quietly. And that also provides opportunities and challenges to make small orders to affluent urban centers. The informal market, I hope and we think I can also mention but this really top British related governments informal market in urban centers, how can we really provide certain guide, guide, guidelines for the government not to over-regulate the informal sector, but at the meantime make sure that food provided by the informal sector is safe, is safe, is nutritious, is healthy. And most importantly, our Global Food Policy Report every year provides data on several key indicators, hunger, Global Hunger Index, I think we have worked with the WHH and the World Concerns in producing Global Hunger Index. And in that report, some of the key data are there. We also track how government has invested in agriculture research, how government has invested in agriculture in general, and policy making capacity, and whether government or country have the capacity to make good policy and to track the productivity in the agriculture sector. Productivity is for a total factor of activity. So it's not just man productivity, labor productivity. So it is a total output versus total inputs. So we can really track how efficient, how, how productive the whole sector is. So the challenge is urban hunger and malnutrition. I think the multiple burden and the triple burden of malnutrition has been mentioned by Brave and Helen. So I'm not going to repeat over here. But the urban poor face the real challenges because they don't produce food. And most of the urban poor do not produce food. They depend on the market. What does that mean? It means if they have money, they will be able to access to a very diverse, nutritious, healthy food. The condition they have to have money. If they don't, obviously, it will be 
Okay, it's very expensive for them to access your food. And you might know that there is a term called an urban de desert. Urban desert. A food desert. A food desert. So in many neighborhoods, you do not find grocery stores coming in shops and that provide healthy, nutritious, affordable food. Because simply the poor people in urban slums will not be able to afford it. So the private sector is not coming in. So this is a big challenge. How can we really make sure that urban desert, urban food desert, not just the slums, will disappear yeah, from our history? And obviously, they are very vulnerable to income and a price shock. You know, I say the different on market feed the family. And then limited access to basic services. So, good food the security, nutrition security, depend on food, absolutely. But it also depends on sanitation, clean drinking water, safe drinking water, good toilets. Even if you have good food, if you do not have good sanitation, your children will have diarrhea. Every month, that children will stop growing. Children, children, children will be stunted. So let's make sure that other basic services are also there. I think the key message from our report, the not track is we need better data, more timely data. So Brave has highlighted some of the data. It's good. But we do not have a mechanism to connect the urban malnutrition, particularly the triple burden of malnutrition, systematically and very frequently. All this data. You know, we can act on this data maybe every four years, five years, and two days. If we wanted to take actions, set the right priorities, we need a timely data, accurate data, of probably more disaggregated, disaggregated, disaggregated data by different communities. The diet are changing with urbanization. So I come from China, you know, I just, I can use my own experience, my relative experience. Yeah, we were very hungry, just about 20, 30 years ago. Smallholder production in Jiangsu province, where, the, you know, where the army has worked, right? So we were very hungry. But today, we have too much to eat. All the way, obviously, diabetes. Diabetes is coming. Like a big crisis. 15%, 12 to 15% of people are now already diabetic. And more and more are in a category, category called pre diabetes. Now, I'm, Sorry to say that, I might be closer to that than <laughs> that one and two. So it's a serious crisis. And I just need to know that in the United States, first time, the night expectancy has come down. And part of the reason is because of the weight of reason. Part of the reason why the people are overweight is because of diet, in addition to lifestyle, exercise, lack of exercise, and so on. So, and every year, we lose. Well, obviously, all this problem, you know, market burden on market, is a, it's a moral issue, it's a development issue, it's a health issue, but it is also a health issue. So every year we lose more than 10% of our money. <laughs> now, urban growth is reshaping agriculture value chains. And Bart Minton is our country director for, for Ethiopia, so he will illustrate how the value chain has developed, even in some of the poor countries in Africa. So that quite a revolution uh, is happening. And uh, some uh, from stable food to value chain to vegetables, fruits, dairy production, uh, and so on. But I think to show the case that the policy research, the policy action still do not look at the middle part. We either focus on production side or consumption side. Anything in the middle is missing. So I call it the missing middle. Um, I keep changing the missing middle terminology. Uh, we used to, middle income is missing middle. We don't focus on malnutrition issues in the middle income country. But now, the missing middle in the value chain uh, must have more attention from us. So the private sector, the policy making, and the research, and uh, well, the CGI, I think the CGI is still very much on the production side. And, and it's one of the champions to really try to reshape the CGI the uh, research towards a food system approach. Uh, I think we must continue to work on that. I think we have another CIR colleague here, with David Davis here, uh, food safety issues. Um, so governance, yes. Governance, I wanted to save more time for Regina to talk about this. I hope you will take that challenge. One of the issues that I have is there is still an um, isolation between urban and rural areas in designing food policy. The mayor of Shanghai and the mayor of Nanjing, you know, they're not the big cities in 
China, they also try to look at the food security, nutrition security in their urban centers because they have been asked by the, by the government, the top government, you've got to pay to your nutrition issues, all the way to obesity issues in your city. Well, it's great, clear accountability, but they never try to look at that issue beyond their city boundary. <coughs> they wanted to promote highly automated, highly, let's say, mechanized, with so called hydroponic farming. And well, I'm not against it, I like it. But look beyond that urban boundary to look at the, the small village, uh, my village, <laughs> which is only about two hours away from Shanghai. Beautiful man, good people there. We can easily produce healthy, nutritious food and provide just like in your small town, right? I think this is a great opportunity. So, and I have seen a lot of food and nutrition security designed by Minister of Agriculture. And a very rarely they use urban centers as an opportunity to drive the agriculture. Yeah, when we look at the rural areas, they also look at the export markets. But they don't look at the urban centers as opportunity. I mean, this is something we must fix. So the incoherent policy in designing food nutrition policy or strategy. Rural urban linkages is so critical. I'm so glad that FAODG and I co authored a paper to really look at the opportunities to link millions and millions of small businesses, and millions and millions of small, poor, undernourished urban consumers. Huge opportunities, policies, investment, value chains. But right now, that linkage is broken. Just give you one example in Nigeria. I think probably Ethiopia is something. Just 20, 30 kilometers away from Lagos. These smallholders can produce beautiful tomatoes, rice, fruits, vegetables. But in the meantime, the urban consumers in Lagos, in Lagos depends on imports to feed them. Every year, Africa imports 35 to 40 billion dollars of food. But in the meantime, all the smallholders in Africa has great potential to produce more. Just the 20, 30 kilometers, that development chain is broken. So how can we fix that? That is a key message. Um, Jose, Brianna, Bissau, and I gave to you guys. So let's look at the, the whole chain, fix the linkages. It will be a win win for smallholders, win for urban consumers, and win of many multiple goals of SDGs. We did some exercise to see okay, how the different linkages have helped to deliver different goals of SDG, for example, reduce, reducing food waste, food and loss by investing in uh, logistics, um, as, to develop medium-sized, small, small-sized cities, as, as we mentioned. So don't just look at bigger guys, Shanghai, Beijing, Lagos. There are many, many small, medium-sized cities that can provide a huge role in making smallholders to uh, urban consumers. And then we also have done some case studies from uh, from Vietnam, Ethiopia, Ghana. I wish the researchers and our partners in civil society can provide more cases where we can really promote much better link to different case studies to scale up some of the, um, the successes. So urbanization is a challenge, as we have heard, as we have done in our survey. Our survey clearly show that many people, more than seventy percent of the people, think it's a challenge. But I truly believe it is an opportunity. We must work together to tackle some of the broken linkages, some of the incoherent, incoherent policy, and a lack of investment, lack of governance. Thank you. So I let Regina to have a chance to discuss this before. Give at least five minutes. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fun. And uh, let me invite uh, Professor Regina Berman to, to join me in the front here. Uh, Regina, can you come? And she's very small. Look, look how fresh she looks, huh? Just flew in this morning from all the way from Washington and uh, still looking so strong. Thank you so much for being here. 
Well, thank you for the friendly introduction and thank you also very much uh, for the invitation to <coughs> share some thoughts uh, on IFPRI's Global Food Policy Report. When IFPRI started to introduce the Global Food Policy Report, uh, there were actually some skeptics and they were asking, do we actually need another report? There is the FAO's uh, State of Food and Agriculture, there is the State of Food Insecurity in the World, there is the World Development Report. And I think IFPRI has really shown with this series of global reports that uh, IFPRI can add a very important voice and very important analysis to global food security through these reports. So I think that the report is really special and I would uh, highly recommend to read the entire report. It has six thematic chapters that provides uh, interesting analysis on different topics in a very accessible way. It also has, I think, a very interesting analysis of regional trends, so that I think it gives a very good update on what is happening in different regions of the world and what are the specific challenges there. So I think that uh, adds a lot to the global overview because it also, for example, includes what's happening in Latin America, which may not be so much on, the, on the everybody's agenda, but I think it provides very good insights. And what I think is also a very important uh, contribution that IFPRI is making is uh, the section on the data, which presents not only the data, but also presents uh, some uh, overview of what are the major trends in these data. And I think these data are particularly important for two reasons. Yeah, some indicators are very important uh, as a research tool. For example, the ASTI data, you know, the data that IFPRI provides on research in agricultural investment has actually done it for many years, uh, one of the most important sources for researchers who do this research on agricultural productivity, and that IFPRI is now also publishing the TFP data, the data on total factor of productivity, I think is also a very important contribution because that is one of the most important indicators that really help us to understand how agricultural productivity is progressing in different parts uh, of the world. And other indicators are very important with regard to advocacy. You know, for example, the Global Hunger Index I think has made a big contribution in terms of providing a tool for advocacy, also for NGOs. And also the data on public investment provide a lot of transparency on where do countries actually put their money and is that actually aligned with their policies. So I think there are very important uh, contributions in this uh, report. Uh, Maybe some highlights which I found particularly interesting is a uh, good analysis of uh, what is actually happening with regard to food security in, in urban regions. Perhaps one could differentiate more, I would say there are two major trends in this urbanization. One is that smaller cities grow and people may end up to live in urban areas not because they move but because the areas in which they live have become urbanized. And that is quite different uh, from urbanization in very big cities. Yeah, they grow because people migrate there. And the challenges in these two areas and the opportunities might be quite different. And I think that could invite a more differentiated analysis in the future. Also, I found very interesting uh, the emphasis on what's happening in slums and the particular food security challenges because they're linked to the health challenges in the slums and also the political economy and governance issues that are related to address these problems. And uh, the chapter on global urban linkages I also found uh, really very interesting. One has to acknowledge that IFPRI more than 10 years ago already started to do research on that and declare that as one of their research areas. And I think the very important uh, topics like how is that linked to the SDGs. Or also very interesting data one can find in this chapter on reshaping how, how cities reshape food systems. For example, there's a big debate on food waste, and that chapter really provides some interesting data on that we have to take a very differentiated uh, view on how much food waste is there actually in, in different systems. And uh, I'm a bit biased, I must admit my favorite chapter was uh, the one on governance and informal food markets that Daniela Resnick from IFPRI's governance program has written. I think uh, that is excellent in several regards. Uh, it, for example, throws light on the role that perceptions of informal markets and food securities have in shaping actual policies. And these perceptions may not really be in line with the actual situation 
And very importantly, the chapter also pays attention to the role of the political economy in addressing these issues. The report makes quite some uh, suggestions for further research, and here I would like to make some comments because I believe here the research uh, could actually go even further, so some suggestions uh, on uh, further research that IFPRI or others can do. I think that other becomes very clear from that report and other analysis. The big challenge is the following. Why do agri-food systems in an increasingly urbanized world not lead to better health and nutrition outcomes? And if you look at industrialized societies like the ones in Europe where we are, the bad news is that development does not solve that problem. Development solves many problems and has many advantages. But if you look, for example, I'm a member of a scientific advisory council to the German Ministry of Agriculture, and we've just been looking into these issues of sustainable diets. So if you look at the situation in Germany, you find that uh, for the male population, their consumption of meat is double the amount of what the German Society for Nutrition recommends. Double. At the same time, if you look at what is the nutrition situation in marginalized sections of our society, those who are in social security, you find that those households do not have sufficient money to provide healthy diets to their children. Yeah, so we do have severe malnutrition problems in marginalized groups of our society and overnutrition in most of the rest of it. So ultimately the question we need to ask, why is that actually happening? Yeah, why does development lead to such unfavorable outcomes? And from an economics perspective we have to ask the question, what is the underlying market failure here? Because if you cannot understand what the underlying market failure is, I think we are ill-advised to find good policy instruments. I think we have become very good in analyzing the symptoms of the problem. Yeah, and I think this uh, whole concept of the nutrition transition describes these symptoms very well. But what are really the underlying market failures? And I think that is a topic of research. I would also consider it as governance research that uh, is really necessary because if you better understand that as developing countries uh, undergo this transition you know, to a more urbanized uh, society, maybe they can avoid some of the problems that the industrialized countries have run into. And uh, just one example, what are the questions we need to ask if we want to better understand what leads to this market failure? And here I would ask the question, what is the role of big corporations? And of course, uh, there's a lot of flag and criticism by NGOs of big corporations and their role in the food system and for the political discourse that may be very important. But they do not really provide the underlying analysis. It's not because the CEOs of these corporations are bad or these corporations are greedy or whatsoever that we observe these problems. But there are some fundamental problems in the kind of incentives that they face. And let me just ask one question that one could ask in this regard. What is the role of the increasing concentration in the sector? Does the increasing concentration reduce the diversity of the food systems? And then you can ask both for those on the retail side, but also for those, for example, on the input side. We observed an increasing concentration of agricultural input industry. Bayer and Monsanto, for example, or the Chem China and others. Does this reduce, does this concentration reduce the diversity of food? And I think there are important economic mechanisms one has to consider. These companies focus uh, a lot of research effort on very few commodities. And because of the big gain in productivity on these commodities, they become increasingly, it becomes increasingly attractive for farmers to grow those commodities and not the others that are not subject to the same level of investment such as legumes and so on. So that may be one important driver behind less and less diverse food systems that then translate in the end in less diverse diets. And these are the kind of questions researchers need to ask. And I think Chuck Weiler's example was a very good one. 
that research also needs to be published in the end, yeah, because it may be uncomfortable. But as if pre is actually well placed also to publish uncomfortable results. Yeah, and I think this is really what I would like to uh, encourage is to better understand the underlying problems of what we observe. And the link to that is the research on how can we actually influence then these uh, unfavorable outcomes. And I think that is a very big issue when it comes to nutrition. Because in liberal democratic societies, governments face major problems to influence what people eat. That is a very big issue. i just give you an example also from Germany, from, from the Green Party. They wanted to act on this issue that uh, consumption of meat, for health reasons alone, is actually very high. If you look at other issues, for example, what is the climate footprint of your diet? That would be another reason actually to change it. <laughs> so the Green Party, they suggested to have a veggie day, so in public um, institutions one day a week, vegetarian food should be offered. That caused them so much flack and so much opposition that they decided never ever to touch this topic again. <laughs> so, but I think what this really shows is that we don't really have good governance instruments to deal with these issues. Yeah, there are some ideas like nudging, can you maybe somehow otherwise convince uh, the people, or there is this whole issue of labels, which role can standards and labels place. I think that's also a very important topic for if please research, for example. Not only taking nutrition, but more generally the environment the impact of food consumption into account. So I think there are a lot of interesting topics for, for future research, and I'm sure if we will take uh, many of those up and the partners as well. And uh, I'd like to congratulate you Free again for this really excellent Global Food Policy Report. Thank you very much, Professor Werner. Uh, Shane, you, you have a few questions. Maybe just one or two together. One or two very quick ones. Very quick. <laughs> we don't have any directly at the end of the coffee break, so very quick. Uh, uh, who would like to ask a very question? Just one hand at the back. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. My name is Lucas from Looking for Food here in Brussels. And I have one question on food prices. Because on the one hand, it's great they are low, because people can afford also people's less means can afford them. But on the other hand, they're very catastrophic because because of the low prices, people don't care enough about food, they throw it, there's no appreciation, there's all the waste because it's so cheap. What is your perspective on this? That's an excellent question for me. I asked Jeff, you also come over here. I want to go over Jeff, you have a question. <laughs> uh, I thank you very much for both uh, very interesting uh, contributions. I have a question uh, for Madam uh, Berner. Berner. It's, um, it's about um, the, the approach, uh, uh, about the, uh, the, the meat approach of the, of the Green Party. Um, it's not new because many governments are thinking and how can we influence uh, choices of people. Um, this is not something you can do only from the perspective of agriculture and, and food uh, policy. You also have to look at education, health, etc. So it's, it should be a multi-sectoral approach. And my suggestion is that probably you can respond, react a little bit. Uh, try to have incentives because people indeed don't like to have a kitchen police. Um, they walk, but they are uh, sensitive to have, for instance, um, incentives from the insurance, uh, uh, from the health insurance. If we can decrease the contribution to the health insurance, if you behave well and you're uh, taking care of good food and good activity. Um, Let me start with that question. I could also hardly respond to the beginning of question. I think. It's a policy failure. You cannot ask the private sector to change their behavior. You have to be responsible for this people. So how we have failed? Because we have not been able to internalize a lot of externality. Sorry to be <laughs> sort of too theoretical. Maybe, but I say that we don't talk about theory. I think theory comes from practice. 
And then we use that to, again, to revise the practice. So here, IPRI has done a study to look at the taxing meat. You know, different meats have different externalities, <coughs> mental health externalities. Can we internalize all this in price, get the, the price right? So if we did a study together with Oxford to tax beef, mutton, maybe others, and then use that money to support a more healthy nutritious food, including some of the more diverse, diversity type of food. Do you know what the result? The results every year we'll be able to save more than half a million people. Could you imagine? If we continue to do that, that's a very conservative approach. So taxing, I mean, that's maybe a very aggressive approach. And the private sector will respond to that. They will be able to make money. The problem is we fail the policy. Begin it. <laughs> yeah, that was also one of the recommendations of the advisory council was to put, uh, or to reduce that there is a, a tax on food items is lower than on other items, the value added tax. So the idea was that to reduce this privilege only for the meat uh, that actually didn't go anywhere because I think the political economy challenges of that are quite substantial. And uh, another problem, of course, of the tax as an instrument is the distributional effects. Uh, the, the low income population is more than proportionately affected. The, the recommendation actually was then to have special instruments or special support for those low income groups that would actually help. But I think economic instruments alone will probably have limited effect. I think there is a huge, uh, still underutilized potential in the whole issue of nutrition education in the schools, in the way in which uh, public school feeding is used. And I think especially looking at developing countries that are still undergoing this nutrition, by investing more in nutrition education, they can perhaps better avoid some of the problems that industrialized countries have run into. Use the tax money to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you very much.